Hey, good morning. It's Sunday. No, wait, it's Monday. Monday, November 4th, 2013. Welcome to Solder Smoke 156. We have a special treat for you guys and gals today. This is a uh, kind of a return to the technology that is at the root of the Solder Smoke podcast. We're going back to Echo Lake. We have a special guest. He's on the other side of the world. It's 9 o'clock at night. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. For him, it's 9 o'clock at night. It's 5 o'clock in the morning for me. And we're uh, circling the globe with solder smoke this morning. So uh, let me just turn it over to our special guest. Take it away, Peter. Good morning, Bill, from sunny Melbourne, where it's about 9.19 p.m. at night. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Peter. I feel like I know sunny Melbourne through your... Um, through your videos there, through those fantastic videos, especially one about the Beach 40, very aptly named. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're welcoming our special guest to this uh, this edition of Solder Smoke. It's uh, the world famous guru of, of of simplistic, not simplistic, guru of simple enough phone of DSB. We're talking about Peter Parker, VK3YE, who's very kindly agreed to be with us on on Solder Smoke. I've been a huge fan of Peter for many years. When I was first getting started in double sideband homebrew construction, I came across Peter's work on the web and I found it really reassuring and inspirational because he had all these fantastic rigs built into really kind of, I don't know, kind of, kind of, how can I put it, ugly kind of containers. <laughs> Containers like the ones that I used, you know, I, I always say that it's always intimidating when you see these really neat, beautiful construction projects, and you think I could never, I could never do something like that. But when I saw some of Peter's rigs, you know, into these like food containers and things like that, I said, yes, I can do that. Well, anyway, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. Let me see, see the first question. Maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the role of the um, of the interviewer, and you could be the interviewee. How's that? Let me ask you this. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in in, in ham radio and, and when you started getting involved in homebrew phone. Go ahead. Well, I started in ham radio in 1987, having um, been a shortwave listener for about three years before that. Um, I started off just tuning in stations on um, 3.5 and 7 megahertz using um, just uh, a couple of transistor radios, one covering um, a shortwave band. 80 metres was probably about 4 or 5 millimetres on the dial, so it was somewhat hard to tune stations in. And then the second receiver operated as a BFO using the second harmonic of the local oscillator when that was set up on the AM broadcast band. So that's how I tuned in SSB. Um, that was... Um, nearly 30 years ago actually now and uh, then I um, about a year or so after that I um, got my novice ticket a bit of a battle in getting a trans uh, transmitter going um, built various CW rigs and eventually um, got on the air with a one valve crystal controlled CW rig um, similar to the circuit in the 1973 ARRL handbook but using a 6GV8, which is an old um, XTV um, valve. And that was crystal controlled on 3.58 megahertz. So that's how I got on the air. And the receiver was some sort of broadcast receiver or shortwave receiver with another radio as the BFO. So with that very primitive setup, I managed to uh, make contacts mostly cross mode from CW to SSB. Oh, that's amazing. That's good. <laughs> that's a really. Uh You've got a real. That, that's the that's the that's the story of a true, of a true radio amateur's initiation into the hobby. I mean, using the other the other receiver, as, as the BFO. I mean, that that sounds like a story coming out of uh, out of Gene Shepard from the 1930s. But hey, there you were with the same story, in the 1980s. All right, tell us this. Okay, so CW. What do you? And I don't. You know, this is sort of a a subject of, of almost religious sensitivity in the ham radio ranks. But one thing I've noticed, Peter, over the years is that you, you, you like me, seem to be more of uh, more inclined towards the microphone as opposed to the key, and this puts us, I think, in a bit of a, kind of a minority status 
in the QRP community because I think it's safe to say that most QRPers, most QRP home brewers, are more oriented towards towards CW. Um, when did you become a phone guy? When did you know that you were more oriented towards uh, towards phone than CW? And tell us a little bit about your early experiences with homebrew phone. Well, my early experiences in homebrew phone were like my early experiences in homebrew CW, i.e. failure. Um, I tried to build an AM transmitter, um, trying to various means to modulate the CW rig that I had, and it wasn't all that successful. Um, it's you, you could hear your voice on a local receiver, but um, I didn't get much in the way of uh, long distance or, or any other contacts with that. Um, I was given a radio from an old, uh, from a, a cow, it was actually in a farmer's cow shed, and that was a valve radio, and that used a, um, um, a solid state circuit to generate the high voltage, so it actually ran off 12 volts. That wasn't home brew, but I did modify it to 80 metres and uh, did have some contacts there. Um, I started seriously in double sideband in about the early 90s, um, building a double sideband rig for 80 metres, which I then converted to 160 metres. So pretty much since the early 90s, um, I did also have a home brew 2 metre rig that I built around then as well, which I sometimes use portable. But most of the time, although most of my contacts are on the phone, mostly double sideband or single sideband, I still make contacts on CW and still occasionally build CW rigs. So um, I, I do use both modes and there is a place for both. There's no doubt that CW and QRP do sort of go together. It's very simple to build transmitters and you can go away a long way with a, uh, little power. But um, there are some that have been deterred from QRP because someone told them that voice QRP is ineffective. Um, I think this is fairly old law, probably dating from the AM days when AM was significantly less efficient than CW um, and also less efficient than SSB. Um, and a lot of the old customs and, uh, and sayings have probably uh, are held, but... Um, uh, SSB is, you know, has been quite successful for me. Um, there's some bands when it can be quite difficult, 20 metres for instance, but um, other bands like 40 metres where uh, um, SSB and double sideband have been highly effective. Um, and uh, it, it might amaze some of the North American listeners that uh, we have here a foundation licence with a 10 watt power limit and uh, they're recognisable because they've got a, a four letter call sign suffix yet they can and do work DX on phone. So there's no doubt that QRP on phone definitely does work. Um, there are a few caveats about that, which um, maybe we'll get to later on. Yeah, <clears throat> very interesting. Well, I, I, you, I see here that you're, you're almost literally 10 years ahead of me, at least, because while you were getting to DSP in the early 90s, as you said that, I was thinking I, I got into it in the early 2000s, I guess DSB. Where was I? Yeah, I built my first DSB out, out rig out in the Azores, and it was inspired by an article in CQ magazine by uh, Doug Demore, and that, that's what got me into DSB. Yeah, and on on CW, I I agree with you. I think um, it, it there's a lot of people today, a lot of the newer hams who might be kind of turned off from home brewing because they're they're they've got licenses that didn't require them to learn CW, they could be very technically oriented people, but they're just not they're, they're just not into building homebrew gear for CW for a mode that they're not all that interested in. So I <clears throat> I really think that the, um, the 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 group of younger hams who are involved in projects like the BitX or or simpler DSB rigs, I think that's very encouraging. That's the way to go. I, I notice a lot of interest in uh, in homebrew phone among that group. So uh, but I think that's something we should <coughs> we should keep in mind. Um, yeah, and about lore, um, you mentioned you know the, the, the lore about uh, about CW being being more effective. I want to ask you about another little bit of lore, and this is something that I came across uh, repeatedly when I was uh, getting 
started in homebrew, among older hams, among real old timers sometimes, I've found the belief that, uh, well, you can build your own transmitter, but building a receiver is, uh, is, is too difficult for the, uh, the uh, average ham. And uh, I wonder if you've ever come across that, and what are your reactions to that, Peter? Go ahead. Well, I think there's a grain of, of truth in that, especially if you are building homebrew uh, transmitters. Um, because if you are building a... Um, um, like, you, you can make contacts with a 2 or 3 transistor homebrew transmitter. However... Um, there now. Now, of course, I, I might get onto uh, one of my, the, my hobby horses about uh, something that's too simple to to be practical on the air. But um, we'll just talk about receivers um, for a moment. Um, I suppose there's there's a thought that having a good receiver means that uh, bearing in mind this probably goes back from the days when uh, people didn't know the frequencies of of things and it could be considered that having a good calibrated receiver was an extremely useful piece of test equipment. You would know approximately what frequency your transmitter is on. You could listen to the relative strength of harmonics. You could hear if there was any chirp on the receiver uh, or, or coming from the transmitter and, and various other things. Um, and particularly, uh, and one, one thing with the old, you know, Regenerative receivers, although they're great for a shortwave listener, they, uh, the regeneration can be set back so you can listen to AM shortwave broadcasters. You can hear CW and SSB on them. However, as a res companion receiver for an amateur station, they aren't so good. They, they don't have particularly good front-end overload performance. If you do try and monitor your own signal on them, your local signal will probably be too strong for them and... Uh, and uh, and possibly overload it. So I can I can certainly see the um, merit in the view that a good receiver is a foundation to uh, being able to build your own transmitters. Um, if you have a bad receiver, you can't hear anyone, and you you won't be able to make contact. Um, and if you are trying to work other QRPs in particular, then um, a good receiver is extremely important. Um, in terms of selectivity, overload in performance in the face of strong signals nearby. So I sort of subscribe to that view, even though I didn't start that way. And also, receivers have become somewhat simpler. Um, we've had receivers like, you know, chips like the NE602. They're not the strongest signal handling device, but they are decent. They are okay um, and, uh, and perform quite well. Um, another thing, I suppose, is the um, uh, I mentioned before that regenerative receivers didn't uh, don't particularly hook up very well with uh, uh, amateur transmitters. However, direct conversion receivers are a completely different kettle of fish. You can use the same local oscillator in a direct conversion receiver as you can in a CW transmitter, and it's even simpler with uh, double sideband. Uh, direct conversion receivers and double sideband uh, are made for one another. Uh, with CW, you have to uh, um, make provision for a frequency offset, whereas with double sideband, you don't have to. You're automatically on the frequency. So I, I, can, I can understand the view that a good receiver is extremely um, important. Um, however, it's probably become easier than before to build a reasonably good receiver. So... Uh, it, um, and especially with direct conversion, although you still have the issue of the audio image, um, we can talk about phasing and so forth later on and filter and the filter method, um, it's become a, a lot easier even to build uh, simple SSB uh, receivers, a, a crystal filter and say five or six transistors will deliver quite respectable performance and uh, you'll be... Um, so I'd highly recommend building a receiver um, if, if you are into QRP, there's nothing wrong with using your commercially made equipment as a receiver and maybe building a, a separate transmitter. Um, and as well, there are some designs like the Pixie, for instance, which I can uh, go on to 
um, talk about later that have a very, very rudimentary receiver. And if you're wanting to work other QRP stations, that's possibly uh, not the uh, right approach, especially if you're a beginner and you're not quite aware of the deficiency. So it's probably a good thing to be exposed to a reasonably good receiver. Anyway, that's a fairly long-winded reply, though, Bill. Oh, very good, very good. And so many things you said kind of resonated here, uh, Peter, no pun intended. Um, yeah, you know, when I look back at my own experience in home brewing, first with CW and later with uh, with phone, I guess the the real sort of the anchor of my efforts, the base of my efforts, when I look back on it, is the Drake 2B. I mean, I had, I've had this Drake 2B here as... As everybody's heard many, many times, I've had it here since uh, since about 1973. And I got it with paper route money from my Elmer, but it was that receiver that I first used with the the first real CW transmitter that I built, and then later I replaced it with um, a bare bones superhead receiver, and then again years later. So I guess the first CW rig was probably in the early 90s, was in the early 90s, in the Dominican Republic. Then in the Azores, 10 years later, when I was getting into DSB, I first built a, um, a DSB transmitter. And again, at first, used the um, the Drake 2B before I built uh, the receiver. And a, a couple of phrases that you've said here, and I saw this on your, um, on your website, uh, too simple to be practical on the air. That's something that you hear from the um, some of the real uh, gurus and wizards in this uh, in this game, I know that um, that Wes W7ZOI has. I think I've heard him say that too. That you know the minimalist movement is all well and good, but you can you can take it to an extreme where you're getting the parts count so low that you're really you know sacrificing performance, and that's that's not wise. Uh, I was of course delighted to hear you um, talking badly about regens because of my, <laughs> of my long-standing belief that the, that the regens are somehow uh, possessed. Um, I have, and I'll, but, but when you talked about the, the direct conversion receivers, I guess that's a, that's a good kind of um, segue into the world of double sideband because another thing that you said really resonated with me, and this is something I, I discovered on my own, was that double sideband rigs, double sideband phone rigs, transceivers are really simpler to build than double side, than not double sideband, but then 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 your CW trans transceiver using the direct conversion receiver, because, precisely for the reason that you mentioned, because of the the the, uh, the absence of a need for any kind of frequency offset between transmit. And receive. I remember looking at that that first DSB rig that uh, Doug Demore described, that uh, it, and realizing that that little local oscillator could easily drive a uh, direct conversion receiver on the other side, and that's that was just simplicity itself. So maybe tell us a little bit about your early days in CW. In um, let's see, I see a timeout message coming up here. Fifteen seconds. We might have to reconnect. But um, tell me, I'm talking too long. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, there are a couple of um, points there. Um, first of all, the um, too simple. Yeah, simple is good, but not too simple. I, um, I suppose you know QRP does come in different styles that appeals to different people, and I think that's one of its strengths. It can be anything from uh, AA1TJ's transmitter, which I think he made out of an old shaver, to a KX3. Some people build stuff because just because they can and hardly get on on the air, while others um, are more into operating. Now, for me, a QRP rig, if a QRP rig is unlikely to build in a reasonable time, and it may not even be finished, then it's too complex. That that's that's my standard. If it's if you can't build it in a reasonable time and probably can't finish it, it's too complex. So so don't bother starting it. But on the other hand, if it doesn't easily get random unarranged contacts, then it's too simple. Um, that's random unarranged contacts. So I think if a QRP rig does that most of the time, then you're on a winner. Um, if it can't do that, then it might be fine for a novelty beacon or something to uh, produce nice waves on your oscilloscope in the shack. But 
not really a usable rig. Um, an interesting parallel um, with receivers, getting back to receivers, um, um, if you have a look at some of the receiver articles by Doug DeMoor, in almost all cases Doug will say that you don't need S meters, AGC or DSP. Um, they don't contribute greatly to basic receiver performance and just add complexity. That, that's pretty much word for word. But then he goes on to say that you need frequency stability, a good front end and a decent audio stage and it's worth spending time on these. And Doug was absolutely right. And I think there's, it's the same deal with QRP transmitters. I've seen fairly complex designs floating around with digital frequency displays and inbuilt Morse keyers, um, which are all very good. But when you look at the basic transmitter circuit itself, it might only be crystal controlled and might only put out a few hundred milliwatts. And therefore, as a transmitter, it won't be that effective. And I think the complexity is better spent in areas that will get more contacts like frequency agility and more RF output power. So I think some designers have produced quite cute rigs in some ways that have quite novel features. But as far as basic RF performance then, um, they're not necessarily a rig designed to be operated successfully. Um, the art of successful QRPing is determining the extent, in my view, um, that you can keep making compromises and get, a, get away with it. You go lower and lower in power, keep going down with simpler gear and smaller antennas and you can still make contacts and it's amazing what you can do. But eventually you reach a point when the contacts stop coming and then it's time to scratch your head and reappraise your station. That tiny QRP rig in a ballpoint pen, it might look cute, but it's strictly a write-off. Instead, I think you need to go back to radio fundamentals. Um, you've got to have a, put a signal in a distant receiver and you need a signal strong enough to overcome a certain path loss. That all gets into propagation theory, output power, antennas, the noise at the other end, even how good the other guy's receiver is and their operating skills. And uh, the first thing that the um, um, many beginner books and articles on QRP do is they compare QRP with high power. Um, this is really the nub of it. Um, 5 watts compared with 100 watts is a loss of 13 dB. So an S9 signal drops down to S7 with QRP. And it should still be readable provided there's not too much noise or interference at the other end. But one thing that they don't always tell you is the behaviour of signals under different receiving conditions. It's different. You can hardly hear a 3 dB drop on good signals if they're well above the noise, but if the signal's competing against the noise, then 3 dB is a big, big difference. And it can make the difference between your signal being equal to the noise and buried in it and being twice as strong when conditions are marginal. So with 90% of stations that can hear you might, might be able to hear you with 100 watts, drop down to 10 watts and maybe 70% will still hear, so that's pretty good. But down at 1 watt, only 20% might be able to as you're near the noise level. So things like losses and efficiency is really, really important at low power levels. But the converse is if you're building a rig, then a power like 20 watts will get you nearly as many contacts as 100 watts. So there is a certain sweet spot, spot there is a certain sweet spot I'll repeat that again. There is a certain sweet spot in relation to transmit power output. And it's different for different frequencies and different distances that you want to cover. Um, now, if we um, take something like a, an ultra-simple QRP project, often recommended for beginners, and this gets into the receiver's uh, thing, um, dare I mention rigs like the Pixie by name? We're probably going to lose half your listeners and you'll probably get lots of angry comments below. But anyway, I'm going to persist. Um, and, uh, and I'll happily wear any vilification about to follow. Um, if you are thinking about building a rig, especially if you're a beginner and it's your first project, you really need to add up all the losses and success comes to those who minimise them. As, and let, let's compare you know, our 5 watts, which is the maximum that will allow for QRP, versus 100 watts. So we're already 13 dB down, which often is, is fine. Now a simple rig might only put out half a watt, 500 milliwatts, so that's 10 dB down on your full 5 watts. Um, now a simple rig might also be fixed frequency, crystal controlled, and that means the other stations must come to you rather than you come to them. And 
so there's no fr freedom to move your frequency to find other people or a clearer spot there there's less interference so that's another 10 dB loss now a bad or poorly tuned antenna probably another 10 dB down operator skill if it's a new, um, newcomer operator and you're not used to digging out weak CW signals that's another 10 dB so you add all them up and you might be 30 or 40 dB with a pixie and a bad antenna and a novice operator versus a good 5 watt rig, a good operator and a decent antenna um, and so that can be an area where people might give QRP a go and find it's not for them because they are trying to do something that's uh, somewhat simple and I think that's excessive simplicity um, stupidly simple you, you could argue as opposed to something that is fairly simple but workable and you have a much better chance of getting contact so that's you have to think about that if you're thinking of designing a QRP rig you look on the web and you see this great two transistor design or something with crystal controlled um, and uh, you might even read that the author made a whole heap of contacts but they, they might be better skilled they might have a better antenna there might have been a, a QRP contest or something so really think about um, what you want to do with the rig when you build it and that goes for if you're thinking of buying a rig as well as uh, buying a kit or uh, starting something from scratch and uh, um, and things like frequency agility really important a good receiver is handy things like CW frequency offset is is great on CW you could be having people coming back to your calls but you're not hearing them because you've got the frequency offset wrong if you're using a, a direct conversion receiver off the uh, same local oscillator as the transmitter and um, also um, uh, receiver performance so they're all things now I'll put it back to you Bill I haven't answered the uh, question about double sideband which uh, you might want to repeat um, okay Peter really great good stuff I really liked your continuum there for um, um, too hard to, to build in a reasonable amount of time at one end and uh, unable to produce random unarranged contacts at the other end. I guess I've been occasionally, uh, I've, I've occasionally moved into the, uh, the the second part of the spectrum, uh, unable to produce randomly uh, unarranged contacts. And I guess I, one of my first uh, homebrew projects was, I think, uh, kind of a quintessentially too simple project. I think it's something that a lot of beginners uh, try, and uh, it's not entirely unwise to try it but I'll, I'll explain why it's the uh, the Michigan Mighty Might this is a, a one transistor oscillator crystal controlled with the coil wound around an old uh, plastic um, film canister 35 millimeter film canister and I remember I built one of these things and and you know the uh, I think the article in CQ magazine promised um, all kinds of fantastic uh, rag chews on on 40 meters with this thing and it just didn't happen for me, but I was really pleased to be able to get the thing to oscillate, and I could hear it oscillating on my Drake 2B. It took me some struggling, but I uh, I finally got it going, and it, it was a very kind of encouraging moment for me because I was able to actually produce RF. Never spoke to anything with the thing, but I still think I have it floating around here someplace because it was kind of a milestone. Another um, way too simple rig that I built that definitely does not produce random unarranged contacts is um, the um, the little rig where it, the, it's one trans one transistor one MPF 102 that serves as um, a very very QRPP oscillator on transmit and then you throw the relay and the thing becomes a very simple regen receiver and uh, I, I built that thing and I I, I kind of I just like it. And it's sitting here. I've never, never had a contact with it. One of these days, I'll just pull it out and struggle, and make at least one contact with it. But I, but I haven't done it. In terms of simplicity and and uh, and Doug Dumas' kind of um, rules of the road, I'm I'm very much in agreement with you. Um, no S meters, no AGC, and um, and and Doug was very into uh, variable crystal oscillators to get you that frequency agility with stability. So um, I, I recently found myself uh, trying to build a VFO and failing, and then going back to uh, the Doug DeMoss teachings and building myself a VXO. So I think my next rig, I'm actually going to 
bite the bullet and try to try to build a real stable VFO because of course of course uh, Doug and um, and Wes and and others provide a lot of good guidance on on how to do that and I think that's going to be one of my next uh, challenges yeah on the pixies and chips well let, let me I'm going to repeat the question up oh, there I go see this is keeping me on the straight and narrow what do you think about chips versus di discrete components but first a little bit about your early experiences in DSB uh, transmit only or receive over to you okay um, I'm just trying to remember I think I might have initially built a transmitter only it would have been for 80 meters um, DSB but there's uh, but I would definitely recommend a transceiver um, uh, having a separate transmitter and uh, with a transceiver with the same local oscillator you're guaranteed to be on the correct frequency you can also um, save one of the great things about um, DSB is the economy of components um, if you look at the local oscillator chain you have a crystal or VXO or VFO its buffer and the balance modulator um, that will often be a four diode type arrangement that can be common to both receive and transmit which is what the Beach 40 does um, and so you have a significant proportion of the components that are common to both um, and uh, and it's probably developed to its highest level with the SP5 AHT's phasing SSB rig. Um, yeah, so I, I, I might have started double sideband with a, a transmitter only, but it was very quickly augmented with a receiver section built onto it. I, I definitely highly recommend that approach. Uh, 35 millimeter film canisters, well, that's exactly what I used for the coil in my first transmitter in its. Um, uh, I think in the Pi network, I think it was about 20 tons of wire on it was uh, a close round was suitable for the Pi network in the um, 80 meter CW rig that I started off with. Um, VXOs, well that's um, certainly a, um, I'm a big fan of VXOs as well. First of all starting with uh, one crystal and I, I find I'm able to get greater frequency shift than uh, Doug was fairly conservative in uh, the frequency shift you could sometimes get more and especially if you had two crystals of the same frequency in parallel I think um, um, the, the Japanese um, pioneered that they called it the super VXO and so I built a rig um, once um, uh, and the, the sort of shift you could get were amazing I uh, before I learnt about that I did build a 7 meg CW rig and with one crystal on I think 7020 I could get something like um, 17 or 18 kilohertz shift which was uh, pretty impressive and covered a fairly active section of the CW end of the band but with the Super VXO you put an identical crystal in parallel and you can double or even triple your shift um, I've been able to get up to 100 kilohertz shift on 10 megahertz and uh, there was this uh, unusual one transistor circuit it looked like a culprit's oscillator but there were actually three crystals um, one crystal was about 17 megahertz and then there were two crystals 10 meg in parallel and the thing seemed to operate as two oscillators and a mixer so you could actually get an output of 7 megahertz and, uh, and get a tunable uh, range and that was one of my earlier double sideband rigs which I've still got and then later on that ceramic resonators have come into their own um, first of all 3.58 megahertz which um, over here covers both uh, uh, an SSB frequencies and CW frequencies I think in North America that's mainly the CW end I think you can get ceramic resonators for about 3.69 which might help for the uh, um, phone band in other areas you know as well as here um, and I think they're used in some European rigs and also 7.2 meg ceramic resonators which if you uh, uh, which you can get them to cover almost the entire section of 40 meters at least for the phone uh, segment um, my most recent rig the Beach 40 Mark II uh, that goes from 7050 up to 7.3 with a 7.2 meg ceramic resonator so that really appeals to me decent stability and uh, only one, tra one transistor for the oscillator and another for the buffer um, an example of frequency agility which you want and decent stability so it's a really good sweet swap spot between not being too simple and 
um, providing uh, reasonable stability. As far as chips versus discrete components, I've used any 602s in the past and they've been great, and 741s and LM36s, um, but I do love the idea of discrete parts like um, uh, like the BitX, um, the, the idea of just a 20 cent transistor, um, if something goes wrong you can easily replace it. The overall cost is probably not much more than ICs. You don't need to worry about uh, matrix boards and having uh, um, bits of wire going from the IC. You can build everything dead bug style or, or paddy board and um, without worrying about um, uh, thinly spaced IC pins. So. I, 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 you know, I think home brewing with anything is good. Um, I did build a two meter FM receiver with an MC double three six two, and that was a fantastic chip. Um, that was almost a complete VHF receiver and a chip, and uh, I used that for a, a home brew two meter FM transceiver. But uh, most recently, most of my construction has just been using discrete transistors. Yeah, I'm very. I, I hear you. I know what you mean. We've, we've been. I've been talking about this a lot on the blog in conjunction with my build of the uh, of the BitX 17, and uh, yeah, the discrete components. I think you know, and I a lot of my early rigs had had chips in it, and uh, sure, there's a there's a place for it, um, but uh, but I do prefer the discrete components, and I'm, I'm really pleased that on the BitX 17, I've been able to make it completely uh, completely discrete. So that's fun. But you've said some, a number of things I wanted to comment on. Um, yeah, the two crystal Super VXO. I remember when I was struggling with the the VFO on the BitX17. You uh, s shot me an email saying that this was this rig was crying out for a uh, a Super VXO. I think you were right. I, I eventually went with just a a regular kind of non-Super uh, VXO with just one crystal in there because I had a couple of the crystals I, that I needed for uh, to get on. Um, 18.1 megahertz with a 5 megahertz IF. I just happened to have a, another uh, receiver here with that IF on on 17 meters. So I just pulled the crystals out of there, and that's what's gone into the uh, to the BIDX. And yeah, and ceramic resonators. I have um, ceramic resonators at uh, at 14.2 megahertz in my um, 20 meter double sideband rig. Um, and I find that the double sideband rigs get a lot of attention on uh, on the internet, on YouTube, and you're a, you're a really terrific uh, producer of, um, of videos. You're an excellent uh, explainer of your rigs and presenter via uh, via YouTube, and you've got that fantastic uh, Melbourne uh, beach uh, backdrop. But uh, I, um, I did that one little video on uh, the homebrew 20 meter rig, and it's got 75,000 views. <laughs> I'm astonished. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a bit over I think a little over about six or seven years, but uh, still a lot of people looking looking at this stuff, uh, Peter. Um, let's see. One thing I want to ask you about when you when you got when you first it's double. How is double sideband received? I mean, not not technically received, but how do people react to it uh, when you get on the air in Australia? Are uh, are people surprised? Because I I find that when I get on with double sideband, it's it's such an unusual experience for the guys at the other end. And when I sometimes I I I, I kind of it's it's kind of fun to tell them. I say, okay, listen, now you can you can hit the lower sideband button on your transceiver, go to lower sideband, and you will hear me just the same, and I will hear you just the same. And they they kind of don't believe it. One of my most gratifying experiences when I first got on double sideband on seventeen. I had a uh, uh, an old timer in the UK come back to me and, and and tell me that I was on the wrong sideband, and I I couldn't resist. I just responded. I said, No, no, I, I can't be on the wrong sideband because I'm on both. <laughs> All right, that's my message. It's keeping me straight and honest. Let's move on, Peter, to SSB. Tell us about the noblest the noblest wonder and the uh, transition to simple but effective single sideband. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bill. I I certainly uh, can't resist commenting on a double sideband and the reaction of other stations. Basically, they don't know, and that's how it should be. If your signal is stable, undistorted, clear, then there's no reason for them um, to tell or suspect that you are using double sideband, unless you tell them, of course, and uh, it becomes a bit of a, a novelty. So. Um, 
Um, now, if you try and work double sideband to double sideband, I know it's something that um, Doug warned about, saying you, it, it couldn't be done. Um, it would be very an interesting exercise to try to very stable crystal controlled double sideband rigs to see if they can uh, communicate with one another, and that's a, a possible uh, minimalist avenue. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the Noblis Wonder. Um, it has got a lot of attention. It, it's a great rig. Um, and I've had a lot of contacts, and in some ways it goes against um, um, what I said before about crystal control, because it is only on a single frequency um, that's inherent in its design, and uh, it will. And if you were to make it frequency agile, then it would cease to be an SSB rig. You would have to uh, um, take out the crystal filter, and it would uh, only become a double sideband rig. Um, in a way, there's. Uh, of course, modern rigs you know, are known for their push buttons and displays and menus and all that sort of thing. The Noblest Wonder is the complete polar opposite. Um, there's not even a volume control. There is no tuning control. And I think that using it just is just philosophically very different to using any other transceiver. And the reason for it is that when you turn it on, and this rig doesn't even have an on-off switch, I just have to plug the uh, 12 volts into the back, you must accept what comes out of the speaker. Um, you, you cannot change the volume. If it's too loud or too quiet, then I have given the option of a headphone socket so you can plug in headphones. Um, you cannot change the frequency. You cannot change the volume, RF gain. So what comes out of the speaker is um, is all there is. And you, your brain, and your ears must make the best use of what comes out without any other twiddling at all. Um, many amateurs tend to be twiddlers. If there's a knob on a rig and the signal is somewhat weak, or even if it isn't, they'll often be uh, twiddling the RIT or the IF shifts or, or playing with the DSP. Well, the Noblest Wonder does not give you that option at all. Um, you must concentrate completely on what comes out of the speaker. There is nothing that you can do to improve or, or change reception. So you sort of have to accept the Noblest Wonder. You could argue maybe it has the personality of, of a cat. It is completely independent. There's nothing you can do about it. It is either on or off, so it could be considered to be a, a somewhat of a, a binary rig. Um, you are at the mercy of fate with the Noblest Wonder. You cannot change the frequency. If there's someone a couple of kilohertz away and you're hearing their splatter, then that means that you simply cannot use the radio for as long as they're on. So, um, On the other hand, though, it has been a very exhilarating rig to use. If... Uh, I have worked New Zealand on it, which is about two and a half thousand kilometres, and uh, that's because they happen to uh, come onto that frequency and, and put out a call. Whereas uh, with a um, double sideband rig such as the Beach 40, which is frequency agile, I've worked a whole heap of New Zealanders. Even though it's double sideband, so the power is spread over both sidebands, it's frequency agile, which, as I mentioned before, you will get more contacts. But the uh, um, but there is a certain um, appeal to using the uh, Noblest Wonder that, that, really, appear, um, that uh, really does grab me. And also the receiver performance is rather good. Um, you've really got very little between the antenna and your ears, yet you do have quite good selectivity due to uh, the crystal filter. In fact, I, I prefer listening to it, um, the Noblest Wonder. I prefer that to my IC751, strangely enough. Um, so the Noblest Wonder, for those not aware, it's very similar to the BitX. Um, think of it as like a BitX, but without the frequency conversion front end. It's, um, um, there is no frequency conversion. The IF is on your operating frequency. So and luckily there are crystals that are fairly cheap on amateur frequencies. Um, I, I think there's frequencies like 3.686, 3.579, in this case, I used 7.159, which um, you can pull the um, carrier oscillator crystal up to 7.160 and uh, use four or five other crystals also on 7.159 as the crystal filter. And that will generate very good lower sideband. 
somewhat sharp, but people do say that it penetrates very well, and I've had excellent reports for the two watts that it puts out. So I wouldn't recommend it as your only rig. I would recommend something that's frequency agile, like the Beach 40, even if it's double sideband, but the Novelist Wonder is, is, is a joy to use on its own terms, and you must accept it if you are to use that rig, because it gives you no other option. Um, now, and then of course, um, if, if you want to evolve from the Noblest, something like the Noblest Wonder, then you can add a mixer and uh, a local oscillator, a VFO, and then you can cover a band of frequencies rather than just a single frequency. But I, I did things in reverse. I actually built my bit X before building the Noblest Wonder. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure if I've uh, answered all the uh, questions on the Noblest Wonder and the evolution into the bit X bill. Oh, very good, Peter. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the Nombus Wonder, I, I, I really, I liked your, your, your presentation on that. It was great. I <laughs> just like the way you described it. You have to accept it. <laughs> it, it. You know, it reminded me a little bit. The only the only other person I've ever seen use this uh, this concept, I don't know if you've seen his, his stuff on the Internet, but uh, Gene W3PM uh, has done a lot of really, uh, great design work for the Whisper system, the weak signal propagation reporting system. And Gene, um, a few years back, put out uh, a, transist, a, tr a transceiver, an SSB transceiver, using exactly the concept you just described. And he was building it for specifically for the uh, the, wi the one Whisper frequency that uh, that we all we all use uh, on on 30 meters. And I uh, I, I I didn't. I never built the whole thing. I only. I built up basically using bits and pieces of Gene's circuitry. I built up a, a DSB version, but uh, it, he. The, it was always very intriguing. His uh, his his sort of his novelist wonder for whisper on on thirty. Um, all right. Listen. Are you, oh, oh, this brings us to um, to SSB and the BitX, and I am really. Uh, I'm I'm very late. To get it, getting into the BitX game because BitX has been around, I guess, since about 2004, when Farhan's uh, original design came out. But uh, I I really kick myself for not having built one of these uh, earlier. This is my first SSB transceiver. I have a an SSB split operation on 17 that I've been using for a long time. But I went ahead and just built the BitX, and I I really I love it. I love the design. I like the simplicity of it. My receiver sounds great. I know exactly what you mean about just enjoying listening to the receiver. Sometimes, I, even if the band is dead, <clears throat> even if 17 is dead, if I'm sitting here in the shack early in the morning, I'll turn it on just because I like to listen to the band noise on the bit X. <laughs> that shows you how devoted I am uh, to this rig. But uh, it's it uh, the when you read about the the thought that went into the design of it, Farhan was consulting with Wes, so there's a lot of genius at both ends of that discussion, and uh, I, uh, I really like the, the whole concept of it and the end product. It's I, I must say that BitX is the rig that I have had the least trouble with in terms of uh, debugging and uh, getting um, amplifiers to stop oscillating and all that kind of thing. The least amount of trouble I've had with any rig that I've built, and this is probably the most complicated rig that I've built in that it's a, it's a real SSB uh, transceiver, but I but I really love it, and uh, I wonder what your thoughts are on um, on SSB with the knob. <laughs> let's move move beyond knobless and let's talk about uh, SSB transceivers. Uh, back to you, Peter. Well, SSB is something that uh, I avoided for a while, and I think it was about in about 2000 that I built my first SSB rig after about nearly 10 years of double sideband, and it was inspired by a rig called the TCF, and that was designed by Drew Diamond VK3XU, who just recently has uh, been admitted to the QRP Hall of Fame, and uh, he's written a lot of articles and a lot of... Uh, books, radio projects for the amateur. I think there are about four volumes. So uh, that was based on NE602s, and the TCF stood for Twin Crystal Filter. So um, the transmit and receive were 
almost completely separate based on any 602 type uh, uh, chips for the balance modulator as 741s and LM386s and there were two crystal filters because the crystals were cheap enough and it avoided the need for fancy switching. Um, now W3PM, uh, Gene, um, well he also inspired me into Whisper and I did exactly the same thing. Being the lazy guy that I am I thought well I, I won't bother about the filter for now I'll, I'll just uh, see what I can do with double sideband Whisper and, and I did and uh, and um, and it worked quite successfully so uh, I built a um, just a transmitter only for 10 meg and uh, in another box built a transmitter and a receiver for 7 meg so I didn't actually uh, automatically put in the re I didn't have automatic switching so you have to wait your two minutes and then manually switch from transmit to receive um, but that, that's been a lot of fun um, yeah well I see the um, Bitex as being the latest uh, sort of, uh, there, there's, there's been a whole stream of quite simple SSB rigs and there's been times when people have sort of forgotten about the approach only to be rediscovered. Um, I can't remember its name but there was a pioneering rig in the 60s. Um, uh, there is some stuff on the, on the web about it and, and that uses quite simple concepts. Um, here in VK there's a, a radio company called Kodan and they make a lot of outback communications gear. Um, they're very robust, um, it can be run over by a truck and still survive and they're designed for the absolute um, uh, person with no experience in radio at all. Um, and they use for the Flying Doctor and School of the Air, those sorts of things. And they're in a green box and you had a, uh, um, this was an SSB rig, I think they were put in the solid state ones would have been built from the uh, late 60s, early 70s onwards and they had the instructions in the lid of the case. Now I like the trail friendly radio concept, you could put it on, on the ground and, uh, and opened up the lid and you had the front panel and the instructions were on the inside of the lid and uh, there were like instructions like run um, 30 feet of wire out from the antenna connection and uh, and, and tune for maximum brightness on, on the light bulb and, and I actually used a light bulb in series with the antenna instead of SWR meters um, for quite a long time um, and I still go on the basis of field strength rather than SWR um, and if the radio blows up because of that well there's something wrong with the design of your transceiver. Um, getting back to SSB um, um, the, the Kodan rigs that were Australian produced, um, still still made but more sophisticated now. Um, then there was rigs like the Atlas 210 and uh, the Atlas 1, 110 twins which I owned and if you look at the circuit of that, that has a lot of similarities with the Bitex. Very very sparse in the use of components. I think the Atlas designers permitted themselves more ICs than, uh, than, um, than uh, Farhan did. Um, but basic concepts um, and very high dynamic range and uh, and I think the uh, rigs were, were somewhat uh, at, um, an interesting design approach for their time which was the uh, mid 70s so um, then in, in the 80s we all sort of went to ICs and uh, um, there were like those SL600 series of ICs that were um, British designs used them but you couldn't get them anywhere else and they were only available for a short time and uh, then we had the NE602 in the late 80s and that was great for a simple receiver or, or SSB generator or double sideband but so then that, there was always the enduring benefit or a thing of um, um, discrete components which um, 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 which the uh, Bitex has really uh, reintroduced to us. So yeah, the Bitex worked pretty much first time for me as well. Um, if it doesn't, it's very easy to pinpoint problems. Um, I like the way that the filtering is switched um, just by switching DC between the various stages, the bi-directional stages um, for those not familiar with des design. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's it's uh, done, done a great deal to uh, have spread the interest in people building homebrew gear because one of the other aspects of amateur law is that um, SSB gear is just too hard to build and uh, a lot of people um, um, when SSB came in that was the time that they um, um, gave up on home brewing and, uh, and bought commercial rigs but uh, something like the Noblis Wonder can be built in about a weekend and something like the Bitex maybe if you apply yourself uh, uh, two weekends or so so it's uh, really brought 
SSB within um, the, the reach of almost anyone and you can start it stage by stage, you can just build the receiver part and uh, work from the back onwards, the audio amplifier, just testing with a finger to see if you're getting any audio and then uh, just with a one, tra one transistor crystal oscillator that can be your signal generator. Um, you can use mobile phone apps now. There's a thing called frequency which you can uh, monitor the band pass of a crystal filter. So it's uh, so contrary to popular belief, you don't even need an oscilloscope or a, let alone spectrum analyzers. It does help if you have another transceiver that can transmit an SSB signal so you align. But with practice, something like the uh, BitX gives you the ability to align stuff by ear um, and um, and I think that's, that's a real skill just having a feel for how things sound and, and just how a receiver sounds you can instantly tell whether the uh, carrier oscillator is right or, or whether it needs to be uh, moved a bit uh, uh, closer or further from the uh, crystal um, filters bandpass so um, um, and building your own ladder crystal filters that, that's another area that at one time, crystal filters were, uh, you know, a week's rage or, or more. But um, with ladder crystal filters, which uh, came in, in, you know, developed in the uh, uh, 70s or 80s, uh, they've really become uh, um, a great thing for the home brewer, especially with um, cheap computer crystals now. So there are all these things that have made home brewing possibly easier and cheaper than it's ever been. And uh, we haven't even talked about phasing equipment yet, which is is a whole another world. Yeah, so much to talk about, Peter. Yeah, so many things. Yeah, I was just thinking about the irony of uh, of cheap computer crystals uh, making homebrew of of simple analog um, discrete component rigs uh, much easier because you can you could get a bag of twenty uh, ten megahertz or or five megahertz crystals and build um, you know many many crystal filters out of them. You know, you're talking about lining up of SSB gear and not needing you know, sophisticated test gear to do it. I know exactly what you mean, and I remember when I built my first uh, SSB transmitter based on design by a, a, a QRP or very active in the GQRP club who wrote many articles for, uh, for Sprat Magazine, Frank Lee. I think his call was G3YEE. Um, Forgive me if I got that wrong, but uh, I used Frank's design, and I needed to line it up. I didn't have any test gears out in the Azores, and I was in regular contact with a friend of mine in um, uh, Sweden, SM4FQW, and uh, we one night got on, and just with me with a little screwdriver there on the uh, on the carrier oscillator, um, aligned it by ear. We might have actually been in contact simultaneously on Echolink in case we lost it on, on the air. But um, we um, we did the, we did that and lined it up quite nicely. Um, yeah, and I, I agree that you know the the thought that SSB is is so difficult is sort of analogous to the idea that uh, a good staple receiver is beyond the capability of of the ordinary amateur. And I think well, I think you and I are really. I, I was joking the other day. I said my amateur status in this game is completely uh, uncontested. <laughs> <laughs> if I can build an SSB transceiver, anybody can. Um, Frank Harris, the guy who has a wonderful book out called Crystal Sets to Sideband, um, sort of alludes to this perception that uh, SSB is really difficult. And I guess it is It is more difficult than DSB. I tell people that if you want to get into phone, go start with DSB and then progress. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, and, but Frank... Uh, his chapter on SSB calls uh, calls it the uh, the Nobel Prize for uh, SSB, sort of the epitome of uh, or the maximum of, of homebrew uh, skills to build an SSB transceiver. Um, uh, one one comment on um, on uh, LM386 chips. I noticed that in Frank's book, he too kind of lamented so many designs out there with you know sort of discrete components all the way through, and at the end they slap on an LM386. Um, again, nothing really against chips, but it always seems to be a, be a little unbalanced to have a rig that everything else is discrete component, but when you get to the audio amplifier, you go with the LM386. A lot of the ARRL QSD designs do that, and, I, and, and in the, with the BIDX, the BIDX, BIDX does it too, but I've found that you can build the uh, audio amp with discrete components. 
Hey, um, Peter, I want, let me, I want to ask you about, tell us about your workshop, your workbench. What do you have in there? And then we'll go back to phasing. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, yes, well, um, it, it might come as a shock to say that I have, I have very little. Um, it's pretty much just a, a table in in a bedroom, um, and, um, and then there's another table next to the with the uh, computer. So uh, um, I don't have a, uh, a much of a, a radio shack, um, although there are rooms with radios in them. Um, I hasten to add not all rooms of this place. Um, so the bench, which I'm looking at at the moment, it's probably about, um, it'd be less than one square metre. Um, and as I speak, it's just covered with circuit boards and bits and pieces and uh, um, then uh, food containers to for the components and then there's a shelving unit for, for that. So... Um, I don't have a separate workshop or a, or outside radio shack, so it's it is fairly sparse. Well, that's something I think you have in common with with many great home brewers. No uh, no real elaborate uh, collection of test gear, and you're just uh, living proof, Peter, that you could uh, do great things with uh, with just with nothing more than than simple simple gear and a lot of a lot of ingenuity. Hey, listen. I know we still have to talk about phasing, and I, I, I'm, you know, as the owner of the Helicraft is HT37. That's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. But I'm thinking we might want to um, leave that for um, for another visit here on Solder Smoke to talk about phasing rigs because we might be biting off more than we could chew. We've been going on here for for about an hour. It's been fantastic, but I try to keep the uh, the podcast to about that length. So if you don't mind. Maybe we'll wrap it up here and then take up phasing at another time. But I want to just to close by asking you what words, if you could just wrap it up with sort of words of advice for um, new and aspiring home brewers who perhaps are more oriented towards phone than CW. What would you tell them? I know you've, you've given a lot of good advice during the course of our hour here, but uh, if you could just sum up and talk to the to the beginners out there who want to, get going with uh, homebrew phone, uh, what would you tell them? Over to you, Peter. All right. Um, basically, there are a few rules, um, or um, you can break them if you want, but um, you may not get very many contacts if you do. Uh, 40 metres, 2 watts, direct conversion, double sideband. Uh, 40 metres is a great band. You, there's activity almost all the time during the day and much of the evening. You can work stations anywhere from locals up to around two or 3,000 kilometres. You can work further, but I haven't achieved that yet on double sideband. So definitely recommend 40 metres or um, 80 metres is also not a bad band for double sideband either. Um, 20 metres, I'd probably give that a miss. Um, it can be crowded, it can be very DX oriented, and um, I haven't actually built a rig for 20 metres double sideband, though I have built some SSV 20 metre rigs and, uh, and have worked DX, but it's hard work, and the contacts you get are, are very often um, your 5 9 contest style, which I enjoy contests occasionally, not seriously, but um, 40 metres. 80 has a more leisurely operating pace that uh, appeals to me. Um, so choice of band 40 or 80 metres. Um, if you are building, I would make it a transceiver, similar to the Beach 40 with a direct conversion receiver because if you have the direct conversion receiver, you can share certain stages such as the uh, local oscillator, its buffer, and the balance modulator, which is also doubles as the product detector. Again, similar to the Beach 40. It really should be frequency agile. Um, you can, if you're a good, build a VFO in a shielded box, but I would suggest a ceramic resonator or a good VXO. Um, I would recommend a frequency range, if you can get it, of at least 30, 40, or 50 kilohertz. Remember, with QRP, if you're the weaker station, people may not always respond to your CQ if they can hear it. 
it's you'll always get more contacts if you are able to call people who are either calling CQ or finishing up with a contact. There's a very good chance of success there, and to do that, you need to find them on their frequency. So frequency agility is an absolute must. As far as components go, um, either an NE602 for the balance modulator uh, product detector or a um, all discrete component is fine. A diode type mixer is will, will do the job. And um, uh, build it first, build the receiver first, get that going, and then um, um, all you need, once you've built the receiver you, and you've got something that sounds good, then that gives you incentive to go onto the transmitter. And having a receiver, if you've already got an existing direct conversion receiver for 40 metres, you are actually 60 or 70% all the way there to building a double sideband rig. So all those people listening out there with a direct conversion receiver, um, jump on the web, look in your books like experimental methods for RF design or solid state design, have a look at simple double sideband rigs and think about how you can convert your direct conversion receiver into double sideband. All you'll need to add is a microphone amplifier. One transistor is fine. You can use an electric insert for the mic and you'll probably need three or so transistors coming out of the balance modulator to um, give you, uh, say, two watts of RF. I wouldn't go much lower than two watts, um, then it becomes harder for people to hear you, um, but two to five watts is quite an effective power level for 40 metres. I can reliably get contacts out to um, around um, 500 to 800 kilometres during the day, and uh, sometimes out to uh, two or 3,000 at night. So. Um, um, that's a good power level. Um, if you want to operate portable, um, build it in a, uh, um, a metal box, preferably with the knobs facing up so it can be trail friendly. You can build an L-match antenna coupler inside the unit if you want. You can just use a half wavelength of wire and uh, that will be quite effective for portable. So I'd, I'd certainly, so uh, my advice to newcomers is build a direct conversion receiver for 40 metres and then um, add, a, add the few extra stages you need to uh, make it double sideband and it's a lot of fun a lot of people won't know it's double sideband and you'll make a whole heap of contacts alright there you go that's the kind of inspiration and guidance that we, we needed and you've, 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 you've pushed me towards 40 meters uh, uh, Peter because that's something that I was thinking about what band I should build for next you know I've had so much fun with the bit I want to build another one you know, I'm thinking about uh, what band and you just pushed me into the 40 meter area let me urge you to check up 17 meters which is my real favorite so I think you should you should give that a go too if you haven't been on 17 yet but listen Peter it's been a real pleasure thanks very much for coming by and, and, and talking to us here on on solder smoke I hope we can do it again uh, we've got so many things to talk about we, st we still have to talk about that beach and your, your operations on the beach and pedestrian mobile and all that and phasing rigs and uh, and what you want to build in the future and all that kind of stuff. So I hope we can do it again real soon, but I think we better wrap it up. Capucho the Wonder Dog needs to go out, and uh, so I have to, to move along. And I know it's getting late for you there in uh, in Melbourne. It's early in the morning here, and it's getting uh, into late evening in Melbourne. So time to say 7-3, and we'll, we'll wrap it up like a real QSO here. We're on Echo Link again, by the way, everybody. I don't know if you've even noticed. We're on Echo Link, going back to our solder smoke roots. Okay, VK3YE73 from N2CQR. N2CQR, VK3YE. Thanks, Bill. Really enjoyed it. And uh, um, I was actually at a Make Affair just the other just the other day, and uh, someone mentioned uh, uh, solder smoke. So people definitely listen to it. And uh, and uh, thank you to you for your inspiration in uh, in motivating a lot of builders around the world. And uh, and long may it continue. Okay, thanks, Peter. Talk to you soon. The Solder Smoke Podcast is produced once or twice a month using roadkill computers in an electronics workshop somewhere in the wilds of northern Virginia. The podcast is available via iTunes and directly from our website, soldersmoke.com. Our blog, the Solder Smoke Daily News, is at soldersmoke.blogspot.com. Send email to soldersmoke, that's one word, at yahoo.com. Solder Smoke is listener-supported. And there are many ways you can help keep the podcast going. Please spread the word. Let your friends know about Solder Smoke, the podcast, and our blog. Put links to the podcast and the blog on your websites. Buy a copy of the critically acclaimed book, 
Solder Smoke, Global Adventures in Wireless Electronics, available from Lulu.com. Begin all your visits to Amazon via the Amazon link on our blog page. In this way, Solder Smoke gets a commission from anything you buy on Amazon. Buy some of our attractive Solder Smoke t-shirts, coffee mugs, and paper stickers at the Solder Smoke store at CafePress.com. If you have a small business, consider advertising on the podcast or on the blog. Our rates are reasonable and our staff is friendly. If none of this appeals to you but you still want to help, well, we have a donation button in the upper left-hand corner of the blog page. However you choose to help, we thank you for your support. Ciao, bravi ragazzi!